Okay, um, hello everyone, my name is Grzegorz Piłowarek and I feel really happy that you decided to come to my presentation. Um, so let's get started. Um, we need to get, uh, I need to get pretty fast because we are kind of time limited. Um, so when it comes to me, I'm, I work in a talk in Warsaw. It's a soft software house in Poland around one house in Warsaw, around 100 people. Uh, and I do all kinds of like back backend stuff from uh, from Java from to Kotlin and Scala. Uh, besides being a, a software developer, I'm also a yo-yo player. Actually, professional one, but retired already, unfortunately. And a musician. I I play different instruments in different uh, weird bands. Um, Okay, and if you want, want to find me online, uh, you can use just this login. You can find me and uh, basically everywhere using this handle. So if you want to look for slides later, just go straight there. Oh, and if you want to get uh, get kicked in Overwatch, you can follow this one. Um, okay, so let's go straight to the essence of this uh, lecture. And so. Two years ago, more than two years ago, uh, the new, the, bra um, the breaking new release of Java appeared, Java 8. It was a very special one because um, we waited quite a long time for it. And the second point is that it brought some new ideas, the ideas from kind of different world of functional programming straight to Java. So um, Java developers, when, when, when they realize, when they notice that they, that they will get new uh, exciting features like Lambda expressions, they were very happy. Everyone was, was very happy because their, their favorite programming language was starting becoming uh, kind of functional. Uh, but uh, after some time, people actually realized that uh, it's not that colorful. So. Basically, when it comes to the functionness of Java 8, uh, it also uh, like goes down to um, lambda expressions um, and some functional control structures like optional stream and computable futures, and actually not that much more. So uh, those ideas from functional programming uh, were only basically those elements shown right here. And actually, some people started started even joking that. Uh, this is basically how functional programming in Java 8 looks like. And actually, it was quite true, because I believe that most of us, this is, <laughs> this is how they are using streams and in Java 8. So after some time, people start to realize that there are some lags. There are some places where Java 8, when it comes to its functionness, could be much more improved. Um, so the first thing is that we got only like free functional control structures. Uh, optional stream and computable future. In Scala, as you know, we have uh, much more of them. Um, there was something like memorization didn't exist. And now, just for the record, don't, don't worry if you don't know those terms. Though This is just f to show you that this is something that you can't live without. Uh, so just let us assume this, and we'll talk about this later on. OK, there is no such thing as partial function lifting. There was no pattern matching, even no tuples. We still don't have tuples in Java. Um, optionals, for some reason, were not serializable and uh, or not it iterable. Um, and the one that actually was, I think, most painful for everyone uh, is that we got streams and optionals, but they were still lack that some APIs were still lacking usage of them. Um, of course, it was it was all caused because because of the fact that Java creators are on the they have a very no noble idea of uh, uh, assuring backwards compatibility. But sometimes you need to break something to make something better. Um, also, checked exceptions in, in lambdas were a pure hell, because um, those functional interfaces that were used as a, mm, as a body for lambdas, they didn't have a throws clause in, uh, in function signatures. So it was very painful. If you if you encountered a, a checked exception in a body lambda, you you would need you would need to manually try try and catch it. And usually, just let's be honest, let's just swipe it under the carpet and just throw a runtime exception. Um, okay. Also, there was something like type pollution. I noticed that some people were kind of confused that uh, instead of one function type, they have consumers, by predicates. By functions, uh, unary operators, and stuff like this. This was confusing for many, for many of us. 
And also um, some operations, some very basic, some very basic operations could be could have been implemented uh, in a much easier form. And probably the list goes on and on. Um, but let's go further. Okay. So before we st jump straight to JavaSlang, um, let's have a have a look and at this signature of function. Nice one. Okay, and I actually decided to implement it. Okay, um, before I show you this, let's just let's just have a look for it, and let's see that we have some parameters, we have uh, some lists as an input, we have some lists as an output. So probably we have some intuition. We can we have some intuition what actually I will be doing with this list, how it uh, how it might be done. You probably expect it to do some simple processing and return the resulting list, but no. Okay, let's see. Okay, I, I decided to implement it like this and throw many, many bad stuff inside. Okay, so if you look closer, you can see that uh, the result of this function depends on uh, internal state of some objects, of some global state, uh, of some exceptions being thrown, and it also mutates the input elements, inputs global, uh, um, modifies global state and instance state, and modifies pretty much everything that, that, that is possible around. And this is the problem, because in this situation we have, we have some set of inputs, and, but as you can see here we have three ones. We have declared params, we have instance state and global state, but it was not shown uh, in this method signature. In the method signature, we assume that the input was only one list, okay? And also, when we end, we also assume that the output is only uh, one list. But as you can see, if if something happens inside the function that might affect some other uh, results of some other functions, this is still actually should be considered as an input, okay? So obviously, in such situation, we might be outputting not only our defined output, but also uh, Instance state, global state, params, and exceptions are also kind of uh, some return values. Okay, so this is how it is usually in, in many cases when you are dealing with, with uh, Java programs written in a mutable, non functional way. And this is actually the way that we usually uh, that we want to aim at. Okay, a perfect state where you have only declared params and declared values, and uh, the relationship between them is uh, as simple as possible. And here comes a very important point that I want to emphasize, is that some, I noticed that many people somehow assume that function, that presence of lambda expressions some kind, some kind of implied that your language is functional, but this could not be further from the truth. Because presence of uh, lambdas has nothing to do with, with your language being functional. Actually, you, if you really wanted, you could have been programming functionally in Java, uh, in Java 7, Java 6. Because there, as long as there is some way of um, uh, expressing some actions, expressing behaviors and passing them around, this will do. Okay? So, um, the, what, what is it? What's the most important... Uh, of advantage of having a, of using a functional programming. The thing is that uh, when we are fighting when, uh, with, when when we are dealing with mutability, we're fighting with such functions that I showed you. Um, there are usually if you if you write it and it works, everything is fine. But when it stops to work, this becomes problem. Okay, so if you have like many small functions that modif that depend on very many small things and produce many different small results, okay, there is a, the, the chance that something will blow up uh, gets up, okay? So if we are composing our programs from uh, methods that might blow up, there's a, the, with some chances of blowing up, you are composing them together and the chances get bigger and bigger. And uh, it's harder and harder to debug it. In functional programming, we start with small, very easy, pure, clean building blocks and try to compose them together. So we start with small things that work, and we try to compose them to make something that work. 
And this is also why, why people often say that if you manage to write something in Haskell or Scala, this usually pretty much works, okay? Because you take small blocks to build something bigger that works too. And at this point, we need to address like, two, two specific uh, terms, like immutability and referential transparency. Immutability is uh, a state of an object. It's, it, those, are, this, those are objects that can never be modified after it's their creation. Uh, this is how we also get thread safety uh, out of the box. And referential transparency. Referential transparency is um, a characteristic of a function where when we call, the, when we call this fun call function with certain arguments and repeat those operations over and over, we will always get the same results. So in such, sometimes if, such, if we could replace like the call, function call with uh, associated value, this would always be true and never cause any problems. Okay, and now there is a, a so basically the such functions that are virtual transparent, they never do, and they, they don't return random values, and then don't do any uh, side effects. And uh, there is a very important thing, because some people are considering that, are thinking that there is some kind of crusade against immutability, I mean, against mutability and side effects. Um, but, act but there is not. The, the whole thing about this is, of course, at some point we need to deal with mutable values. So the whole point of it is that we need to some kind of we are trying to encapsulate everything uh, in such a way that we don't need to deal directly with uh, the problems that mutability and side effects cause. Okay, uh, as I told before, if we really wanted to uh, pass, if we really want to code functionally, we need to have some way of passing uh, fun uh, fun passing uh, actions around. Uh, and it, can, it could have been done. We've been doing this actually quite successively in previous Java versions when we're implementing uh, interfaces on the fly. Um, but actually, if you want to focus on functional programming, it's really actually hard if you don't have a proper tools for the job. Um, so let's have a look at Collections API. If you look at it, the Collections API embrace mutability. There are many different methods that in their the signatures, you can see they never re they either return void or return booleans or something else, but ne it's never a new instance. Uh, so if we want to use like lang lang uh, the, the stuff that's built in into our language, uh, we need to kind of really struggle, okay? Because we need to overcome everything. You, actually, we, in Guava, we had something like kind of immutable wrappers around it. This was far from being perfect. Uh, but the point is that it gets really hard. And sometimes you can see situations like this happen, OK? Uh, if, you have, if you deal with mutable objects, uh, you can, for example, write stuff like this. Um, this is an example with a hash set. Uh, if you can see, we are adding here a certain date, changing it after being added. And sometimes, uh, and then you can see that suddenly, we are losing the identity of this uh, initial object. And those things blow up in the most unexpected moments. And really, it's really hardcore to debug and uh, find stuff like this. And basically, this is where Java Slang comes into play, because it kind of fills in all the blanks that were uh, in Java APIs. By the way, um, the inter interesting story, do you like the new logo of Java Slang? It's nice, right? Who likes the logo? Oh, great. OK. Uh, the, the final story is that somehow uh, we managed to co we ended up at a talk cooperating with Java Slang and Daniel Dietrich and uh, actually helped him with nailing his uh, designs. OK. So what is Java Slang? Java Slang is basically this. It looks, I guess, from far away really bad. But this is not the point. The point is that it's to show that it's kind of complex. Um, and this is what we'll be talking about. This is basically a new collections API, uh, set of tuples, uh, checked, uh, checked function, functions, normal functional interfaces, and uh, functional control structures. Everything, of course, uh, immutable and with very rich, nice APIs. OK, so there are like three most basic building blocks of Java Slang. We have a lambda, we have a tuple, and a value. Lambda is like the per main building block for functional interfaces in Java Slang. Tuples are, tuples are kind of like a way of creating anonymous objects. 
or more like an idea for uh, temporal coupling of some, obje uh, some, some objects that do not really deserve uh, their own class to be cr to created. And value is um, like the super class that represents immutable value and all uh, immutable values and functional control structures. Okay, so let's start with lambdas. Uh, so f at the beginning we have simple f function interfaces. Uh, in Java slang, there is no something like function, by function, try function, and so on. Uh, we have uh, the naming convention is like we have a function, and there the goes number. Number represents uh, the arity of function. Um, and as you can remember, in Java 8, we were limited to functions that were accepting two parameters. In Java slang, we can go up to eight out of the box. Uh, and now, what would happen if we had a checked exception in Lambda? It would be a hell. But here, you can't, the, the all functions come with a set of like their own brothers, checked brothers, um, that uh, have uh, froze signature, in froze clause in their signatures, and don't cause any problems. Okay, so this, those are the basics, but all those, uh, all those uh, functional interfaces have some additional flavors. So for a start, we can compose them. This is basically, this, we've, we had this already in Java 8. We can perform lifting uh, on partial functions. We'll get back to this soon. We can carry them uh, and memorize them. So let's go straight to lifting. OK, when it comes to lifting, it's a term that applies to uh, partial functions. Um, partial functions are kind of functions that uh, do not have a value for, ev for every input. OK, so in, in such case, when we are programming, usually it means that this, uh, some exception is being thrown. Uh, so, but we can change partial function into a total function by performing a lifting. In our programming world, it means that we, instead of returning a, a, a type T, we're returning optional of type T. So instead of exception being thrown, we are ending up with a result being wrapped into an optional. So if, uh, if uh, ca when calculating the result of the function, exception wasn't thrown, the, op the, optional, the value in optional is present, and if exception was thrown, we are kind of losing information about the exception, uh, and the result is an empty optional. And to, if you want to create, a, if you want to lift a partial function, it's very easy because you have a static lift function coming up from, from this class, and that's all. You have a lifted function. As you can see, here is option and here is integer. Okay, and let's try carrying now. Uh, carrying is the concept of, representa uh, of representing uh, fac functions of higher arities as higher functions of RIT1 that return other functions, okay? It might be hard to understand, it's quite abstract, but let's, go let's jump into examples. So if we have some function that takes two integers and sums them together, uh, we can create a carried version of this uh, function by using this instance method. And as you can see, what we got uh, in return is a function of a lower RIT, but returning also, another function, okay? So this function, kind of, uh, this element here is being applied as one of those, and then there goes the second function that represents the remaining part of this argument. And in this way, we can easily apply partial application. Uh, so you can see it right here. So well, we already have this carried, uh, uh, carried uh, function right here, and now we can apply those uh, arguments one by one. So here we are applying two, and suddenly function that was sum at this moment becomes function that adds two to any provided integer. Okay, and memoization is a very fun concept. Uh, this is uh, kind of a caching for function. So as I told before, if we are operating only on, uh, only on immutable values and functions that are referential transparent, in such case, we always know that when we once compute a, compute a value for a certain input, we know that every other function call for this particular input will return the same value. So if we know this already, why not cache those results and save some computational time? So this is exactly what memorization is about. 
we are caching results of uh, for all inputs. And how can we create something like this? As you can see, once again, it's very easy because you can use straight uh, method memorized. This is, instant method. this is an instance method of this uh, functional interface. And we are getting another function that's memorized. So let's, get, let's see how it looks in action. Um, let's use a very bad example for this one, OK? Because we will be, using, we will be playing with random function. Um, as you know, random function is something totally opposite of reference transparent, OK? Because we are expecting the value to be returned, the every value to be returned after every call to be different. So let's try to memorize it. So we created a memorized version of function uh, mathrandom, and we are calling it twice. And as you can see, we are getting the same value twice, which means basically that the first value was cached, and second time when, it was, when function was called, it was returned straight from a cache. Very bad example, but uh, shows nice how it works. OK. Um, in JavaScript, we, we got also tuples, as I told you before, kind of a way of temporal coupling of different objects. And uh, those are not just simple tuples, OK? Because this is, every time in Java when we needed them, we obviously would just simply implement them, implement simple pairs or tuples. Uh, but in this case, those, of course, come with a very rich API. So first thing is that they are, of course, immutable. And you have a rich set of actions that you can perform on them. So let's, let's take a look at the first one. The first one will be a map operation, as you know from the whole like functional thing. Um, so you can map separately those two elements according by those provided functions. And as a result, you get, of course, tuple again, which is, of course, uh, a new totally, totally object. And we are not modifying the original one. And also, we can uh, perform transformation, which means use all of those values that are in a tuple to get something new. Okay, And in such a case, you can see that this is just a return type from this function. And maybe we want to utilize uh, polymorphisms. We want to squeeze as much as we, as, as we can. And maybe create a sequence of those elements as you wish. OK, let's talk about value now. So uh, we have a few functional control structures in Java Slang available. Uh, the first and most popular one is probably option. You, do you know optional from Java 8? Great, OK. So this will be pretty clear how this one needs to be used. Um, we, have also, we got also a new, a new type, try, uh, which is basically kind of very similar to an optional, but this time, the value held inside is all, it can be a result of an operation or an exception. Because try is operating on values or on actions that produce exceptions. So this is our new way for dealing with uh, actions, operations that throw exceptions. This is how, how we can encapsulate and use maps, flat maps, and other useful methods to operate on exceptions. We got also a lazy type, which is a representation of a uh, lazy initialized values. We got an either type, which is uh, another uh, paramonadic structure that can hold inside w one of two types that are, that, is spe that, that are specified by user. Uh, we got also a feature, which is pretty much uh, quite similar to the one you can find in Java 8. And validation monad. This is, uh, this is a tool that allows us to perform validations in a nice and uh, sleek way. Also, the very important thing is that Java Slang is trying to utilize uh, polymorphism to take the best part of it. So all those, as you can see, the interface representing our value is uh, extends iterable. So actually, if you think about it, all those values, option, try, lazy, either of which validation, can be, can be represented as an iterable that holds up to one value. Okay? If option, option with a present value would be an iterable with one value, option empty would be an iterable with zero values inside. Same with try, lazy, either future, or validation. Um, so sometimes it simplifies many things. You will see soon. And the 
the most important thing is that the whole Java Slang collections API is also uh, a value and iterable. So this is, as you can see, the on. So you know it's immutable, and also this is the only like and the common entry points between Java collections API and Java Slang. So this is how we can pretty much mix it with Java by using iterables. Okay, so as you, as I, as I just uh, saw, you all know optionals, but let's get, uh, let's just recall some pre basic concepts. So in optionals, we are, into optionals, we are packing some values that might be nullable, and then we are performing some operations the, on, the, on, the, on this value inside. We are mm, specifying them declaratively over there, and if this value is actually nullable, nothing of this will be uh, performed on this value, will go straight to returning a default value, and if the value is present, this all will be performed and the result will be returned. But there was a one problem. Do you recall having problems with trying to filtering um, stream of optionals in Java 8? Have you ever enc encountered this? Yeah, you see. So there are basically two solutions. The first solution is to manually filter a stream after uh, using predicate, optional is present, and then manually map optionals, to, uh, extract values from them. Well, it's not that bad, but I, have a, I always had some kind of feeling that it could have been done much easier. There's also another solution where you can basically translate an optional to a stream instance and use the flat map. It's kind of, uh, kind of more abstract. But in Java Slang, now we are utilizing the fact that uh, optional is also an iterable. So such things can be much more simplified. Because instead of writing all of this boilerplate code, we can simply write a list dot flat map and, use, uh, and provide it with an identi identity function. Because we know it's iterable, OK? So uh, empty optionals will be translated to zero elements, and optionals uh, with, a with some values inside will be translated to uh, an iterable of one instance. So that's all, one method. Also, when we are thinking about try, this is the way we can deal with uh, checked exceptions. So as you know, if you want to create URIs, they love to throw exceptions, uh, all, kinds of all kinds of them. So we can just manually pr provide it with a supplier of a new value that needs to be created, and then declaratively again specify uh, methods, that uh, actions that will need to be perf would need to be performed on this if it ends up created correctly, or a default value if, this, if there was uh, some exception being thrown. Uh, when it comes to lazy, we have a very nice way of creating lazy initiali in lazily initialized values. So if you want to create, uh, uh, if you want to make lazy result of a, very, let's say, very long computation, you can use method of, provide it with a lambda expression, and then, of course, use the same API as with try and optionals to uh, get the desired results. But of course, this value will get computed uh, in the last possible moment, just like students uh, practice before exam sessions, OK? Last possible while. So when we are actually calling lazy.get to reach this uh, value, this is the moment where everything will be performed on the spot right there, OK? Um, Java Slang also, uh, when it comes to the collections API, utilizes con concepts called functional data structures. This is a pretty, pretty big concept. If you want to get a really uh, good knowledge about it, how it's implemented, you can uh, check uh, videos from DevOps. There was one guy from JRebel that uh, had a talk dedicated only to this topic. Um, so let's, uh, let's go through this quickly, very quickly right now. So functional data structures is something, those are structures that are both persistent and immutable, and those that have all methods, where all methods are referential transparent. Um, when data structures are immutable, this is pretty like I intuitive, because we know that after creation we can't modify them, but what does it mean that, that they are persistent? This actually has a lot of to do with uh, how values are, how those data structures are organized inside. Um, so such data structures, they, after being modified, they have some way of persisting previous versions 
of uh, those data structures. This is, this is good because uh, you can access previ previous versions and also you can reuse ver lists that were already created. Okay? When you are creating, when you are modifying an existing list, let's say, um, you don't need to create a whole copy of it, but instead, when creating a new object, you can reuse the already existing one. So you are saving uh, a lot of memory with this approach. Also, and let's have a look for a second at uh, sequence in Java Slang and sequence tree. Actually, I want to point you to this, this example, the linear sequence called stream. Uh, why I want to do this? Because the streams in Java 8 are, are pretty unique. This is because they are not a real uh, data structures. Those are more like a fancy iterators uh, that allow us to perform actions in like semi-monadic style. But streams in Java Slang are fully are full normal collections that, that we can use. So, and again, all those now when uh, when we are talking about streams in Java Slang and in Java 8, there's one big difference in the API. Because when I first started playing with streams, I noticed that the API was actually quite rich. I actually I was I was amazed how many methods I I could find there. But uh, after playing with Scala, I noticed that, that it was nothing, actually. And this is what happens when you go into Java Slang. When you use your con code completion tool, you see that you get a really, really rich API. And guys, please tell me, um, have you ever missed any particular method from Streams API in Java 8? No? No? Guy, you were satisfied with Stream API, I guess, completely. It gave you everything you ever needed. Okay. I'm missing, for example, index access when I'm iterating over a function. Okay. Index access, index access. Only, only the value. Okay. Um, when it ca okay. This is uh, the the idea I mentioned here was that when in Java 8 Stream API you could not access indexes while iterating. This is actually not really the lack of Stream API because the streams are supposed to work like this. You have only one. You have only one uh, object at a time, and you are not aware of anything in the future. So this is actually, yeah, it's lacking, but this is not how streams are supposed to work. Um, but anyway, if you look at the API, you will see uh, dozens of uh, methods that you probably never use even. Um, the one, the, the, the biggest, the most important one for me was like distinct by. You know distinct by from Java 8 streams. The problem with this, this Java 8 distinct by was that it would always use a, a hashed code or equals underneath. But here you can specify the predicate that needs to be used for comparing two different objects. And as you can see, there are multiple options to choose from. You can drop, you can drop right, drop until, drop while, extend. Group by, return head as an option, return head not as an option, retail, return tail, return tail not as an option, uh, interspheres is traversable again, up and self with mapping, you can return all possible combinations of elements, uh, cross products, you can easily make your finite, finite stream an infinite one by perform cycling. Um, you can cycle it a uh, few times, not infinitely and so on and so on. Of course, you have fold left, fold right, and all different different options. So the API is based on Scala ones and very rich, and you can see, you can, see, you can find here every possible uh, option that you will ever need. One very interesting thing about Java Slang Collections API is the fact that at some point in type hierarchy, they are extending function types. Because actually, why, why, why would you do this? Because actually, if you have maps, maps are a set of keys paired with values, which is basically kind of a partial function example. So why not use maps as functions? Same with lists. Lists are basically a group of indexes paired with some values, okay? So in some situations, we might want to use them as functions, uh, provided for example, pro by providing them to map or flat map functions, uh, methods. So as you can see, once again, we are squeezing uh, as much as we can from uh, polymorphism. And we use, when using this API, we can create creepy stuff like this. Um, we don't have much time, so I will skip this one. And, and let's look at Java Slang pattern matching. 
because uh, it, of course in Java, in Java we don't have a um, pattern matching on the language level, so there needed to be done some workarounds to make this work, but it is. Okay, so what, uh, so what uh, pattern matching actually is? Um, pattern matching is like a very extended, very extended way of doing switch cases. So, um, as you can see here, we are performing a matching, some values, and later on we are specifying different cases uh, for it to fall into. So, if this value falls into this case, into this predicate, this value will be returned. If it falls into here, this will be returned. And here you have a general like wildcard option that matches pretty much everything that didn't fall in one of the above cases. Of course, you don't need to match the. Uh, you are not forced to use uh, wildcards in such situations. Instead, you can use option, which will return optional. So if your value has not been matched, you can return. It will return an empty optional. But the most interesting thing about pattern matching is that it doesn't work only on predicates. It can work. It can, you can match actual values with it. So in such case, we are matching again. As you can see. Uh, some some value, and we are trying specifying different cases. This case, when this value equals to one, when this value equals two, or another time uh, a wildcard. Okay, so as you can see, we can match values, and uh, well, when it gets even more interesting, is that we don't need to match the whole values. We can match by using particular fields of some objects. So let's say let's do the let's do the pattern matching using local date object. So we can specify the whole date like this, okay? But we can use wildcards as one of the fields here. So we have two types of wildcards. We have wildcards with brackets and wildcards with underscores. Um, this one allows us to grab a handle to prefer to, to grab a handle for this particular value to be used later on. As you can see, we used here brackets, and here you have those values extracted. Okay, so, and of course, we, here we have a wild card, another wildcard. Oh, one, one very important thing is that it's, uh, we, of course, can't use, unfortunately, we can't use all of the objects like this. Um, those are all predefined uh, patterns that can be used right here, and of course it doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't work recursively because all those are. This is one workaround. This was uh, implemented by generating loads of static methods. So those are all static methods with different uh, signatures. And if we, if we really wanted to create like uh, a possibility of matching. Uh, all of those objects recursively, the first thing is type inference in Java would uh, <laughs> not manage to uh, help us, and the, the other problem is that when generating all those methods, uh, probably would go over all possible JVM limits by generating dozens of, thousands of methods. And of course, we can create our own patterns by using uh, some additional annotations from another Java slang module. Also, as you can see, we can perform matching by using uh, types. So when we are using when matching optionals, op option, we can specify some or none, which are subclasses of our option uh, class. And again, we can provide here wildcards and use them in functions later on. Of course, when it comes to using cases with predicates, um, there are cases that are very popular that we use all over uh, 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 very often. So, and of course, Java Slang provides a set of predicates that can be used for like very often. So we have like is is in any of instance of none of and many many other or many 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 other. Um, okay, let's have a look at the, some more like real life example when we are matching. Uh, input to some com some command line inputs. So, for example, in this case, we are matching param and checking if the value is inside here, and then performing this operation, and again here. 
There, here, there is one big ugly hack, the RAM method. Because uh, type inference is not, not that smart in Java, the problem is that if you would specify a func normal function here, uh, it would probably be returned by, by off method as a return type instead of being ran. So there needs to be some uh, workaround to be done. Uh, for now, it exists like this, but it will be removed very soon in favor of a better solution. And of course, we, are not, we don't need to use pattern matching standalone. We can use it uh, al along with other tools that we've seen to today, like tries, optionals. We can use them inside functions. So, so some operations become much more easier and much more readable when using this approach. And one last thing is that Java Slang is no, consists of a few different modules. Today we're talking about Java Slang core, but we have also Java Slang Match, which is like a module that, will, that contains all necessary tools for preparing your own sets of patterns for pattern matching. Um, there is a property testing framework uh, being developed called Java Slang Test. We have also Java Slang Pure, which is a very uh, experimental functional programming stuff. We have Circuit Breaker, Fault Tolerance Library, uh, Jackson module for uh, all classes available in Java Slang, and uh, Java Slang Render. So there's a lot of to explore, and that will be all. I hope I managed to encourage you to at least try, at least have a look at this library. Um, slides to this uh, talk will be available on my Twitter. So thank you very much.